I only, I only have 10 minutes to talk about Shaw's algorithm. Now I'm down to eight minutes. So this is ThoughtWorks. It's a great place to work. I've really enjoyed my four years. I'm here to talk about the, the elephant in the many quantum rooms. Does anybody know who these three gentlemen are? And I apologize in advance for the lack of diversity about this part of the talk. Probably never heard of those guys. Anybody know who these two are? Given the subject, you might be able to guess. They are Diffie and Hellman. And can anybody guess these three? They, of course, are Reves, Shamir, and Edelman, the RSA people. So we'll come back to them later. Cryptography. I would hope everybody in the room knows the basics of cryptography. That slide looks massive. Um, Basically, cryptography relies on something that's easy to do in one direction and hard to do in the other direction. Typically, we multiply together two big prime numbers, which is easy to do, but to factorize that large number is hard. So, Shaw's algorithm is a quantum algorithm. It runs on quantum computers. It was first formulated back in the early 90s. How does it work? Well, if you're factorizing a number, I'm going to run through the steps really quickly. If you don't follow this, don't worry. I've got an example. OK, it's got some simple linear algebra in it. Here's a simple example. <laughs> Let's say we're trying to factorize 15. I choose any random number less than 15. In this case, I've chosen 2. The greatest common divisor of 2 and 15 is 1, so I carry on. The period, this is the crucial point. 2 squared is 4. 2 to the 3 is 8. 2 to the 4 is 16, which is 1 mod 15. So if you carry on raising 2 to successive powers, it goes 1, 2, 4, 8, 1, 2, 4, 8. So the period is 4. That tells us that 2 squared plus 1 multiplied by 2 squared minus 1 is 1 mod 15. Therefore, 2 squared plus 1 and 2 squared minus 1 will give us the factors of 15, as we can see, 3 and 5. That's obviously a trivial example. Here's a slightly more complex example. So when I was on the train to work, this is the bit where it's bound to go wrong now, I wanted to understand how Shaw's algorithm works and how complex it looks. So I built myself a spreadsheet. I was trying to factorize 1,517. So on this first sheet, you can see I went through all the powers of 4 to try and find the period with respect to 1,517. And the answer was 90. Now, that's a big number. What that tells me is 2 to the 45, sorry, 4 to the 45 plus 1 and 4 to the 45 minus 1 will give me the factors. Unfortunately, you can see that the spreadsheet, the thing overflowed, so I couldn't carry them through the calculation. So I tried 15, which, God, those numbers are tiny on that sheet. I didn't realize that would happen. Yeah, make them a bit bigger. Period of 15, again, is 90. That was no good. I tried 5, which I think down here we, we see the period of 180, and so on and so on and so on, until finally I discovered that 14 has a period of 24. You can probably just about see that, although I can't. Now, the important thing about that is the crucial number is 14 to the power 12. Oh, it's not 14. I'm on the wrong sheet. Ah. Am I right? Hang on a minute. Uh, wh where's its period? 14. Oh, was it? Nah. Anyway, there's one number that doesn't over overflow. So let's go back to my example. <laughs> the point is, that is. Desperately complex. You can see that these numbers are massive, and that calculation will take forever. If you use a classical computer to try and factorize a number, what you find is that it is of exponential or sub-exponential complexity. So on my next slide, we'll see the actual numbers. So factorizing 1,517, oh, it was 10. I hit the wrong sheet, never mind, eh? So, the period of 10, uh, no, 10 doesn't work, so we move on. 14, the period of 14 is 24. So that tells us that 14 to the 12 plus 1 and 14 to the 12 minus 1 will give us the factors. There's, there's the very big numbers. They are in that spreadsheet. I just couldn't find the right bit. So the greatest common divisor of that big number with 15, 17 is 37. The other one's 41. That's the factors. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because Step number four, use the quantum period finding routine. If you construct a, a classical computer using every electron in the universe as a bit, it will take that theoretical computer longer than the lifetime of the universe to factor a 3,000-bit key. So we're quite confident that RSA is safe from attack 
to any theoretical classical computer. However, if we look at that step four there, think back to that spreadsheet that I had, all those massively complex, huge numbers. Actually, we don't care what the numbers are, the individual numbers. All we care about is the periodicity of that function. So, if you could find a way of discovering the periodicity of the function without caring about all the intermediate results, you can factorize a large number. And if you can do that efficiently, you can factorize a large number in reasonable time. So, Peter Shaw's great insight uses something called the quantum Fourier transform, which thankfully, in only 10 minutes, I don't have the time to explain, because every time I try to explain it, I confuse myself. But essentially, what it does is, inside the quantum computer, you have every number from zero up to the value of the number you're trying to factorize held in a quantum register, OK? You calculate the successive powers of your random number simultaneously. What the quantum computer can then do using the quantum Fourier transform is look at the interference between those intermediate results and yield up the periodicity of the function, but without actually calculating the individual values. Now, it's slightly more complex than that. As I say, I've only got 10 minutes, but what that essentially means is that the step four in this algorithm goes from being sub-exponential complexity, which effectively means impossible, intractable, to being polynomial complexity, which means that if we can get a quantum computer big enough, Shaw's algorithm is potentially quite dangerous to us. If you want to see implementations of Shaw's algorithm in Q Sharp, which is the Microsoft language, my GitHub is my implementation, which is an example of above there. But to be honest, Andrew Breyer, who's one of my ThoughtWorks colleagues, he's a grad. I asked him to do some work for me, and I said, can you work out Shaw's algorithm in Q-sharp? And he did it in about an hour, and it's much better than my implementation. So if you want to see a good implementation, go to Andrew's GitHub. So is RSA dead? Well, you need a quantum computer with about three times as many qubits, that's the quantum bit, as the size of the key. So you'd need about 6,000 qubits to factorize a 2048-bit RSA key. So that's quite a long way off at the moment. And the biggest known computer, this is a bit out of date, this um, about six months or so ago had 72 qubits. So what do we do if RSA is no good? Well, there's an algorithm called BB84, which is Bennett and Brassard. That is provably secure. That's based on the polarization of photons, and it generates a one-time key. It's 100% safe. And there are at least three classical algorithms that you can implement on a classical computer that are going to be safe from quantum attack. We can implement them now, but my understanding is it imposes a performance penalty, and people don't want to do it. And if you're interested in post-quantum cryptography, the Open Quantum Safe project is an open source thing. You can get it online there. And hey, there's a Wikipedia link, because that's where I get all my info from. So why should Shaw's algorithm scare me? So I'm going to return and finish with these, my desperately undiverse slides. So here's a little history lesson. Diffie and Hillman published their seminal paper in 1976. This is the first known instance of people publishing uh, a, a public key exchange. The RSA algorithm was born in 1977, Rivesh, Shamir, and Edelman. That's what we know about cryptography. But who are those three gentlemen in the middle? Well, in 1997, it emerges that the British government had RSA and had public key exchange cryptography some years before those two papers were published. Of course, they didn't tell anybody in the world. Now, what is happening all over the world at the moment, there is a lot of money being invested in quantum computers. No government is admitting how much money it is spending on it, and no government is telling us where those computers are how big they are, and what they can do. I guarantee you that every government in the world, every secret service, is building quantum computers. And I'm going to go further than that. You may think your RSA traffic is safe right now. All of those government agencies are recording all of the world's RSA traffic, and they are holding onto it. Because whilst they cannot decrypt it today, they will have a quantum computer at some point in the near future with which they will decrypt it. So if we, as technical leaders, really want to ensure that our communication is not just safe now, but remains safe for the foreseeable future, we need to start looking at post 
quantum cryptography right now. Thank you very much. Thank you.